Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by not one, but two global leaders. Please welcome Michael Mebar, CEO of MasterCard, and Makta Diop, Managing Director of IFC. Pleasure to have you. So we are ready for our conversation today about trusting technology and the role it can play in post-pandemic recovery. Um, so I'd like to, to go straight into it. So I, I believe that you two share quite a few things in common. You have a passion for development, financial inclusion, digital transformation, but you also bring something very unique to your role. You have a strong Africa experience. Makta, please, can you tell us how working within developing markets and underserved communities is in your work today at IFC? When I was a, a minister for finance in my country, one day I was in a taxi and the person didn't know who I was, and I just asked about growth and uh, what was happening in the country. And the, the taxi driver told me, it's nice to hear about this Minister of Finance making speech about growth, but uh, growth, uh, we would like to see more food in our, in our plate and better living conditions. And I said, OK, the Minister of Finance, we take good note of what you just said. And I think it was a, a, a very good indication on how sometimes we are not translating uh, uh, the big numbers in uh, in, in something which means something for the one and G, like they say in Kenya, or the people, uh, the poorest. And I think that uh, at that time, is, is the time where the technology adoption has been accelerating in Africa. You have seen M-Pesa, you have seen also solution coming in the continent. And uh, it's, uh, it's just uh, fantastic to see that now, 20 years later, Africa is teaching to the rest of the world how to use a mobile, mobile uh, uh, pay payment how you can use fintech to increase financial inclusion, how the person in the markets in uh, Kenya are Googling the things, uh, information, and uh, as the sellers in the African markets are now being able to use uh, 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 fintech and uh, mobile payment to be able to access the market. There is, this, it's necessity is the mother of invention. And, and I think that there are lots of lessons that can be taken from, from the continent. So Michael, you also have uh, a lot of experience working uh, extensively across the, the African continent. What lessons continue to your work? You know, 2007, when I first stepped a foot into our first role on, on the continent, um, the, uh, to your point about necessity, um, I was working for a bank and uh, the business was largely uh, focused on the affluent uh, part of the population. And you said, well, you know, if you look at one and a half billion people on the continent, what else can be done? Which other way can you build a relevant business that makes a difference for businesses and individuals? So you, you come from a niche proposition and say, how do I build out a broader business? It was very much a commercial consideration to find the path to financial inclusion. Then, you know, I joined MasterCard uh, over a decade ago and it was the very same business uh, logic. We had a first meeting in Lagos, I recall that it was three people sitting around a table and say, how do we make a difference outside of South Africa? And we had nothing. So today it's a very broad business spanning the continent and the learnings um, have transgressed Africa ever since. Tra Africa taught MasterCard, uh, Makhtar, to your point. Today, when we talk mobile financial services around the world, it is based on our experience. Now, to the point that we wanted to formalize that, we put a, a lab into Nairobi and said, why don't we just have some of the best minds come together out of a thriving startup community, have them, have them uh, operate out of Nairobi and come up with solutions that we can not only deploy in Africa, but across the continent. So that's certainly uh, a starting point. 10 years later, as I look backwards and say, yeah, what are some of the lessons as we got, went through that journey? The one thing is financial inclusion does matter. We have found for us, it is a long-term market building activity, but at the same time, it's the right thing and the decent thing to do because it drives uh, a local economy. So there's no debate in our company that financial inclusion has to be a pillar of what we do. In fact, inclusion is only a starting point. It has to go to real closing the economic and opportunity gap. So. That's the headline for us. But the biggest part of all of this is you have to be intentional. So financial inclusion cannot be done on the side of a table in an organization like MasterCard. It has to be fully intentional, inclusion by choice, our choice vis-a-vis, -vis, it just happens by chance. 
So those are some of the, the bigger learnings, and there's a lot of granularity that we, I'm sure we can talk about in the next 15 minutes. Um, let's dive into um, the technology now. You know, it's, this world is, is moving fast from crypto to open bank to central bank digital, digital currencies. We see an emergence of solutions at the intersection of currency and technology. It's ever evolving. It's quite dizzying. I think for a lot of people, it's hard to grasp. Um, but I also, from what I understand, the world is keen to understand and use digital money for financial inclusion. So, Michael, to you again, what does this rise in financial technology mean? How does it impact inclusive growth? So technology is never really the solution, but it enables a solution. You have AI, you have cloud, you have artificial intelligence, you have biometrics, you have the whole host of things, and all of that could be part of the solution. The question is, what problem are you trying to solve? So financial inclusion is a big, big word. What is the respective need for a small business? What's the respective need for an individual in one country over the other? Of course, Africa is not the same in the rest of the world. When you think financial inclusion in a much broader context, it takes different challenges um, in developed markets versus emerging and so forth. So, you know, our view is let's not start with the technology. Let's actually start to understand what problem are we trying to solve? Is it digitizing small businesses that are trying to get online after COVID and they struggled you know, having that business before, but then now they need to have it. Or for individuals who are trying to get access to credit and they don't have a track record to do so. So those are the big questions to, to solve and you gotta be clear about what they are. And then you can uh, ask yourself the question, well, is crypto, um, is a digital currency a way to address some of the challenges that you have um, for a particular set of people? Let's take the example of uh, somebody um, who's sending money to their family back home. And that's a big income uh, source for the family. Remittances, remittances are rather expensive today and they take very long. Crypto could solve that. It could solve the price, it could solve the speed issue. But I think we also need to take into account that technology comes with upsides and with downsides. And here we need to think through, well, what about data privacy? What about um, cyber protection? What about some set of principles as we wade into this world of brave new technologies, but we have to do it in a right way. And I think that trade-off always needs to be understood. I'm a tech enthusiast, but it's got to be done in the right way. Right. Magta, um, you know, from some of the solutions that have just been discussed by Michael, a lot of them are being applied um, to the international development space. Um, you know, if we think about what AFC is doing on the, again, the continent, I, I have to keep on mentioning Africa, but um, uh, around the UMOA region and the whole credit score and how it is important to educate populations. Um, but they are, you know, there are major investments that are happening in solutions also like artificial intelligence and biometric authentication authentication, how much of this technology fit in your strategy and in your objectives? No, it's just at the center of our strategy. Actually, we created uh, two years ago uh, um, a disruptive uh, technology department. And uh, that uh, the objective of this department is to invest in new technology that could be helping in solving development problems. And uh, our portfolio has been significantly increasing in this area, particularly in Africa. Uh, so this is show how important is it, it, it is for us. So I want to come back to the point that Michael made. And I think, uh, indeed, the starting point is solving a problem. And the technology is there to solve a problem. And let me highlight a few problems that we've been trying to solve. Uh, health services in a country like Rwanda, which is a country with a lot of hills, for those who, who know the country, uh, delivering blood in some areas will be difficult to do by road and by using trucks. So drones are being used to be able to deliver blood in, 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 more, in more remote areas. The same is now being done in my own country in Senegal. Uh, E-doctor visits in countries now more and more, we realize that specialized services are needed for people. And it's very, very difficult to move sometimes the more uh, educated and the more specialized doctors in remote area. E-health e, e, e be, becomes a solution and that's been tested in, uh, during the time of, of COVID. 
Uh, and there is a lot of application. One of them that I would like also to emphasize is blockchain. At the time when we talk often about low regulation, uh, 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 judicial system, which sometimes in some places is not as strong as it could be, uh, using blockchain to inc increase transparency and, sec and being some uh, security in, uh, uh, in transaction is something that is, uh, is, uh, is, will help a lot in solving some of the problems. But if you don't have the right regulatory framework, if you don't take care of privacy, cyber security, and all these questions that Michael mentioned, we might be facing a, a, a very serious problem that could take us, set us back. We have released uh, last year a big report, the World Development Report of the World Bank was on, uh, on uh, the digital economy, and we highlighted all these questions in that report, and I will really, really uh, 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 for those who didn't have a chance to look at it, to look at it because it raises very important questions uh, that we are discussing today. They require united effort across geographies, across industries, um, so I want to come to one great example that, that the announcement that you actually had uh, in August uh, where IFC, MasterCard, Coca-Cola partnered with a local tech startup to provide uh, working capital to support Indonesian micro retailers with a strong focus on women. Um, Michael, can you talk to us more about this partnership and what makes it a sec successful and unique, please? Right, three and a half million micro um, businesses in Indonesia. So that's a, that's a sizable number. And you know, if you take a step back and see what are the issues that uh, such small businesses have, oftentimes it is the access to working capital. How can I order enough stuff and then have it on my shelves before I sell my oil, my maize or whatever I'm trying to sell. And here you, you look at what IFC brings to the table. IFC brings to the table um, financial resources and ability to help with risk management considerations. Um, we bring to the table digital capabilities and say, you know, this small business, in order to get access to a better working capital uh, conditions, they need to monetize, somehow find ways to collect their data and then bring that to a bank and say, hey, you know, I should have a different uh, form of credit than I've had in the past. So uh, using data, using financial tools, and then you bring um, somebody like Coca-Cola into the mix where you have somebody who owns the supply chain and can provide the data source. To bring all of this together, it's a great example of how partnership can make a real difference. I look at uh, Indonesia as a pilot, uh, three and a half million. If you look at the hundreds of millions of small businesses around the world, I think we'll need to find many more such solutions. As a company, we've said that it is almost a tragedy that the largest employer in the world, which is small business, was the hardest hit by COVID. So we need to do better. We need to do, have more than just pilots. So we took a quarter of a billion dollars uh, last year in March and said we're going to put that up to find more such solutions for small businesses in different parts of the world. Back to the point about understand where the problem is. Um, we're having issue, uh, initiatives in um, in different countries around the world. One particular one that we just launched a, a couple of weeks ago is the Strive Initiative, uh, Strive Community Fund, where we're basically taking $25 million specifically geared to digitizing small businesses that have only had a brick and mortar experience or a business set up before and they want to go online. How do they get online? How, do, uh, how are they safe when they are online? How do they find new customers as they are now operating online and you know, doing marketing? Um, I think what we're doing together here with the IFC is fantastic, um, and uh, together we shall, shall find many more such pilots to really scale this up, because we don't have time. Uh, we need to go out and have those solutions out there today, and not in two years from now. Magda, you were, you've always been advocating, advocating sorry, for technology adoption, and you've, you've been clear on the fact that Africa can be a great example of leapfrogging into the future through technology adoption. Has COVID strengthened this belief? Absolutely. Uh, I'm a member of the Broadband Commission, the UN Broadband Commission, where we are aiming at uh, making uh, uh, universal access of uh, broadband, uh, internet broadband, to, uh, by 2013 in, Af in Africa. So there's a lot of work to do and a lot of uh, uh, regulation to change. To, bring, uh, to make the market much more accessible to competition. Because at the end of the day, all the things that we are discussing will be 
uh, accelerated is the cost of internet in those countries. The emerging country is lower and the access is, is broader. So we are working on, on, on these two fronts and we, make, we are making progress. Uh, 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 offshore of Africa, two large cables, a submarine cable has been now uh, laid, laid down and uh, it will help really ac uh, increasing the, the availability of terabytes. If these two projects are completed, we will have more than 300 terabytes of, uh, of broadband access uh, available for the African continent in addition to what they have right now. So now it will be just a matter of creating the conditions for uh, it to be utilized and uh, to be utilized in a competitive way and reduce costs. That will be accelerating technological adoption. That will be bring solution. And that will be just unleash the creativity of the tech industry in Africa because there are a lot of very talented people who are coming with many solu solu solutions. And it's just amazing to see the speed at which is, is happening right now. Thank you so much. It's such a it's such a rich conversation. Just I, I hope we can commit to help build an entire ecosystem, not leaving anyone on the side of the road. The big topic in the room is the digital divide that's opening up post-COVID because you have the digital haves and you have the digital have-nots. They were there before, um, but COVID is certainly opening up that divide. And you could get depressed about it or you could look at, you know, what do we have today that we didn't have, you know, five years ago? There's all of these technologies. Um, we talk about the power of partnerships. If I just look at the summit and who all is participating and who's making commitments other than the two of us in the moment, um, it is it is very, very encouraging. So I'm, I'm full of uh, positivity around this. I think we just need to make sure we don't leave anybody behind. So, you know, the commitment on the MasterCard side is, is for sure. Yeah, uh, we want to enable a digital economy that works for everybody. As simple as that. And I think we have the technologically the technological tools to do that. Thank you, Michael. A final word, Magda. Definitely, uh, the fact that we have so many people from so diverse horizon getting together in this summit and discussing it shows that we believe in partnership. Uh, the partnership is on finance, on knowledge, on changing regulation, in adapting the economy, the environment, in creating ecosystem is a multi-dimension and multi-form partnership. And that's what I want you to leave, to leave you with. Thank you so much for such a hopeful and rich conversation. Thank you very much.